I'm Jennifer Nyem, your facilitator for today's webinar. Welcome to the fourth session of today's webinar series. And to introduce our speaker, may we call on the moderator for this session, Mr. Jeremy Naredo, MNH very own University Research Associate for Entomological Collection. Let us now give the floor to Mr. Jeremy Naredo. Thank you, Jen. Um, I'm uh, substitute moderator for Mam Pao, who was, is, was unable to attend today. So before I introduce our speaker, uh, just a quick reminder again to those uh, who is this is your first attendance to the seminar. First, make sure that your audio is on mute and your videos are turned off. Second, the Zoom chat box may only be used for sending questions or a uh, rapporteur will collate the questions for screen sharing later. So while the speaker is um, giving her presentation, please enter your questions there. Uh, but do not use it for sending greetings or chatting with other participants. And of course, observe proper webinar etiquette. Okay, all right, I will have the pleasure to introduce our speaker. Uh, Prof. Jude is MNH creator for Three Shoes and Other Small Mammals. And she's currently an assistant professor seven at the Animal Biology Division of Institute of Biological Sciences, College of Arts and Science, UPLB. She obtained her BS Biology from Mindanao State University, Marawi, in 1979, and her MS Zoology from UPLB in 1992. Now she's currently pursuing PhD in Environmental Science also at UPLB. And she has almost 10 years of experience teaching courses in biology, zoology, and wildlife studies. Mom Jude has extensive work experience in biology conservation and natural resources, and has conducted wildlife surveys, researches, and um, lectures on biodiversity conservation in different regions and provinces around the country. Among the things she has accomplished is the formulation of policies for the implementation of laws on wildlife conservation. This was, this was with the then Protected Areas and Wildlife Bureau, which is now the Biodiversity Management Bureau of the DENR. So without further ado, I give the floor to our speaker, Prof. Judy C. de Malipot. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am here to present to you uh, zoonotic diseases of long-tailed macaques. Um, my assistant, my former advice, he told me, Mom, don't you have a witty title like Sir Philip and um, Sir Daisy? I said, I don't have wit. What will I do? So I, I, just a few minutes ago, I added, that's not the monkey. Parang uh, ginaya ko lang si Sir JC. Okay, so let's talk about uh, zoonotic diseases in long-tailed macaques. So, macaca fascicularis, uh, that's our long-tailed macaque, is uh, native to Southeast Asia. In the Philippines, we only have one species, and this is it. So, you can find the long-tailed macaques in forests, along rivers, mangrove, and coastal areas forest edges near farms and human habitations. Uh, lately, it has been considered a pest in agricultural areas and also ecotourism areas. It is a Sinomolgus monkey. It's used in, uh, uh, in laboratories, in, in this medical laboratories. And in the Philippines, it's called Matsing or Ungoy. It's a near-threatened species according to the IUCN, and it also is in the list, in Appendix 2 of CITES, uh, which says, its trade must be controlled to avoid use incompatible with the survival of the species. So this is the distribution of the long-tailed macaque. Uh, before, it was called crab-eating macaque because they thought uh, its main food is are crabs, but then it's an opportunistic omnivore, which is anything uh, edible that it can see or uh, it finds in its range. So at the zoonosis, uh, it's 
an inf infectious disease caused by a pathogen that can be transmitted to humans from animals. So they can be, as Sir JC has mentioned, it can be viruses, bacteria, parasites, and fungi. And then there's cross-species transmission of diseases, which can be from humans to non-human primates or vice versa. So what are the factors that may affect zoonosis? It's the prevalence of infectious agents in the reservoir population, capacity of the potential recipient to sustain infection, and the manner in which species interact, whether they're huddling, they're having sexual intercourse, or they're just grooming one another. So other factors that may affect transmission of infectious agents can be demography, children, uh, are more susceptible to infectious diseases. And then the infrastructure and the immune status of the individual. So here's a list which I found, uh, which lists the paras parasites exchanged between humans and non-human primates and the route and direction of exchange. So as you can see here, the parasites can be herpes B, monkeypox, the polio virus, Ebola, tuberculosis, malaria, filaria, yellow fe fever, gafunculiasis, cystosomiasis, SB40, and gastrointestinal parasites. So we will be discussing this uh, one by one. So the first uh, infectious agent is Cercopithecine herpes virus. This is um, or the B virus. So the macaques are the only known natural carriers of Cercopithecine herpes virus 1. So it's commonly known as herpes B or herpes virus CMA. Uh, B virus is in zootic in macaques. Uh, it is, uh, what do you mean by in zootic? It's, it is uh, transferred within the, um, the group of wildlife. A group, a troop of macaques. It's a, a closely related to the herpes simplex virus endemic in human population. So it's, it is benign in its natural host, but can cause fatal injections in humans. So increasing seroprevalence with AIDS has been seen in populations of free ranging macaques. It is hypothesized that stress associated with captivity and or the breeding season may increase the likelihood of shedding, virus shedding in animals. So there are no human B virus cases outside the laboratory context. The possibility that a pathogenic B virus resulted from the mixing of a variety of macaque species in laboratory setting exists. So most cases of human B virus infection have been associated with apparently healthy macaques. Uh, there, are, there are no herpetic lesions observed, which indicates asymptomatic a shedding of the virus. So this makes identification of shedding animals um, difficult. So what are the symptoms of infection? So oral herpetic lesions such as gingivostomatitis, oral and lingual ulcers, and conjunctivitis have been described. Uh, I think you heard of the term mamaso, uh, which affects children. So that's one symptom of infection. So symptoms are usually associated with immunosuppression or stress attributable to recent importation or crowded housing conditions of captive macaques. They remain asymptomatic and identification of oral herpetic lesions is sufficient grounds for euthanasia of the affected animal. So you need to kill the affected animal. So zoonotic infection with B virus in human may result in fatal encephalomyelitis or severe neurologic impairment. So incidence of human infection with B virus is low, but a death rate of greater than 70% before the availability of antiviral therapy 
makes this virus a serious zoonotic threat. So how is it transmitted? Among macaques, transmission is through close contact. It can be sexual. And humans are infected through direct contact with macaques, such as a bite, scratch, or mucosal contact with body fluid or tissue. Also through indirect contact, such as injury from a contaminated fomite through needle puncture or cage straps has also resulted in human infections. Human-to-human -human transmission has been documented in one case. However, further investigation has indicated that the risk for secondary transmission is low. Human B virus disease generally occurs within one month of exposure, commonly with an incubation period of a few days to a week. Then we have simian um, retroviruses. So if we have HIV, if humans have HIV, the simians have SIV. So SIV was hypothesized to be the progenitor of human immunodeficiency virus, but not known to naturally infect macaques. So this is not fatal on natural hosts, the monkeys and African apes, but exposure to infected individuals and experimental inoculation of SIV in long-tailed macaques resulted in high mortality. So symptoms would include splenic and lymph node enlargement, chronic diarrhea, weight loss, and high incidence of malignant lymphoma. So this, this SIV is of potential concern in zoos and the exotic animal trade and wet markets where African primates may come into contact with Asian primates, including long-tailed macaques. So it is possible that SIV could be introduced into free-ranging long-tailed macaque populations. So this can be when um, captive individuals are return back to the forest then they then if they have SIV they can introduce it to free ranging um, macaque populations so populations of long tailed macaques that have potential contact with african primates should be monitored for SIV especially those which are brought to the philippines and uh, kept in zoos they should be uh, monitored for SIV and then you have the simian foamy virus. So it's a retrovirus in the subfamily Ispumarvirinae. So they are found in many mammals, including cats, cows, rodents, and sea lions, as well as several species of non-human primates. So the host animals mount an antibody response to SFD, and the virus continues to be detected in the host throughout its life. So again, human infection were from contact with non-human primates at zoos and primate laboratories. So also found in bushmeat, bushmeat hunters in Africa and people in contact with wild macaques in Southeast Asia through hunting and preparation of um, bushmeat. So SFB infections in humans is not well studied. But known infected individuals showed the symptom of disease despite uh, zero positivity. Thus, it is possible that humans may be a dead end host for SFD. Then we also have simian type B retrovirus, SRV. These are found exclusively in macaques. So, serotypes one and two are associated with long tailed macaques. And it has been known to cause epidemics of an AIDS-like syndrome in laboratory macaques. So it is asymptomatic in humans. And then we have rabies. Is, um, rabies is one of the more popular um, diseases from animals. So it, this is caused by viruses that belong to family Labdaviridae genus Lysavirus. So a viral zoonotic disease that causes inflammation in the brain of humans and other mammals. And if you have seen a um, person who has been beaten by a dog, uh, then you, can, you will know that it is rabid or, or it has rabies because of it has fear of water, uh, uncontrolled excitement, violent movements, 
and it has inability to move parts of the body, is confused and may lose consciousness. So how is it transmitted? So it's transmitted by animal bites or scratches in humans or other animals. So it can be, uh, it can be infected by the saliva from an infected animal if it comes into contact with the eyes, mouth, or nose. So bats and dogs are the leading sources of the disease. I'm sorry. With known cases of infected rodents as well. However, there is no documented evidence of transmission of rabies virus from macaques to humans. So in travel medicine, it is common practice in Southeast Asia for rabies prophylaxis to be given to people who present to a healthcare provider having been injured, usually beaten, by a monkey. However, it does not mean that rabies is exotic and free-ranging or wild populations of long-tailed macaques. So a number of reasons would cause the absence of infection in the species, and one of which is that monkeys do not occupy the same ecological needs with dogs, bats, or rodents. This, however, does not rule out the possibility of zoonotic transmission among these mammals. And uh, like the bats, um, we also have monkeypox virus. So this is a zoonotic virus that belongs to family Paxviridae, and it can spread both from animal to human and from human to human. The symptoms are similar to smallpox, but with a milder rash and lower death rate. So infection from animal to human can occur via an animal bite, bushmeat preparation, or by direct contact with an infected animal's bodily fluids. The virus can spread from human to human by both droplet respiration and contact with fomites from an infected person's bodily fluid. Now we go to the to family Filoviridae, of which there are six subtypes: the Sudan Ebola virus, the Ear Ebola virus, Thai Forest Ebola virus, Bandibogyo Ebola virus, Bombali Ebola virus, and the more popular Reston Ebola virus. So the virus spreads through the body. It damages the immune system and organs. It ultimately causes levels of blood clotting cells to drop, which leads to severe uncontrollable bleeding. So the symptoms include fever, body aches, diarrhea, and sometimes bleeding inside and outside the body. Ebola virus has disseminated populations of African apes. So Ebola reston virus was discovered in 1989. It is endemic to the Philippines and China. And it is the only Ebola virus existing outside Africa. So it was linked to an epidemic of viral hemorrhagic fever among long-tailed macaques imported from the Philippines and quarantined at a facility in Reston, Virginia. So in 2008, an epizootic or outbreak of Ebola virus disease in pigs from farms in Nueva Ecija and Bulacan was declared and investigated. And this was the, in 2008 and 2009, uh, Philips Group found Ebola virus in Rosetus amplexi caudatus um, in Quezon City and Diliman. So in 2015, another outbreak occurred in a research faci breeding facility of the Newman primates in Laguna. I still remember that I think it was 1994 or 1996 that there was an outbreak of Ebola virus uh, here uh, near Los Banos. And one of our students in wildlife was investigating the uh, case. So what are the sim symptoms of Reston evil virus? Uh, it, uh, hemorrhagic fever, respiratory symptoms. Uh, it shows, in pigs, it showed respiratory symptoms instead of hemorrhagic fever. So workers uh, from outbreaks in farms and labs tested seropositive but were asymptomatic. 
So because the because humans were asymptomatic, they were found to be non-pathogenic to humans and is only mildly fatal to monkeys. However, zoonosis from monkeys and pigs to humans raises a concern for possible viral mutations and future outbreaks in human populations. So the, the Reston Ebola virus is most closely related to the Sudan Ebola virus, which killed 50 to 90% of those um, of monkeys and apes infected through internal bleeding and organ failure. So now we go to vector-borne infections. So these are called arboviruses. So we have family Flaviberidae, which uh, causes dengue virus, and the vector is Aedes aegypti, the popular, ever popular Aedes aegypti. And then you have Zika virus, uh, which the vectors are Aedes albopticus and Aedes aegypti. And the yellow fever virus, uh, the vector is again Aedes aegypti. And family Tugaviridae, which causes, uh, which uh, includes the chikungunya virus, of which uh, the past how many, how many years, of, of 10 years, uh, has caused uh, so much pain to those who had it. And it is, uh, Vector born, the vectors are Aedes albopticus and Aedes aegypti. So these were detected in serum samples collected from old world monkeys, particularly in macaques. So the presence of neutralizing antibodies among wild monkeys strongly suggests that uh, dengue, Zika, yellow fever, and chikungunya are in zoopic. So this virus circulates the forest through sylvatic cycles within vertebrate animals and forest-dwelling mosquitoes, thus continuously posing a threat of spillover to human populations through habitat encroachment. So they said this is because there is no genetic change needed for these viruses to adapt to human hosts and urban mosquitoes. So they can emerge from their current environment at any time without further alteration. So they're also capable of movement from widespread urban cycles into uninfected primates and forest mosquitoes, which could possibly establish a new reservoir for human infections, which are known as spillback transmission from humans to novel sylvatic cycles. So this is how, uh, the Ebola viruses are transmitted. So, in zootic meaning within the wildlife population, then they can, uh, the, the mosquito can go to the urban areas and uh, bite humans. Then there's also a rural epizootic cycle among the same species. And then a virus spillover could go to a dead end and incidental host. And now we go to my favorite topic, malaria. So malaria is a tropical or subtropical vector-borne disease. The geographic extent of endemic malaria overlaps with the natural ranges of primate species. So it is caused by protozoan species that belong to the plasmodium group. So in humans, um, Prior to 2008, I think there were four malaria parasites of the plasmodium group, I mean, in humans. So these are plasmodium vivax, falciparum, ovale, and malaria. And now they have declared plasmodium nolisai as the fifth uh, human malaria. And then you, in macaques, you ha also have five. Plasmodium, Sinomolgy, PNUE, Nolisai, Cotnei, and Fragile. So the arthropod vectors are Anopheles mosquitoes. So in humans, plasmodium infection has symptoms that typically include fever, tiredness, vomiting, and headaches. And in severe cases, it can cause yellow skin, seizures, coma, or death. 
The presence of the simian plasmodium parasites, especially penolcy and long-tailed macaques, suggests that these parasites are exotic and presents risks for zoonotic transmission in the area. Monitoring the natural hosts of this non-human primate plasmodium parasite should be given attention as they are the potential reservoir hosts for malaria infections in humans. So let me let us talk about plasmodium nolsi. So it's, uh, it's declared as the fifth human malaria parasite. And it is zoonosis is widely distributed in Southeast Asia. It was first isolated in 1931 from a long-tailed macaque from Singapore. What is special about it or what is nakakatakot about it is that it has, among the malarial parasites, it has the shortest asexual blood cycle, only about 24 hours among simian malarias, which produces a daily fever peak in the host. This is in contrast to plasmodium malaria, which has, a, it has an asexual blood cycle of 72 hours. So it has morphological similarities with plasmodium malariae that was that is the reason why it has not been uh, detected sorry it has not been detected among the uh, as a, a simian malaria or it's as a different malaria from uh, plasmodium malariae it was first recorded, uh, the first recorded case was in, in, in humans, was in an American sur Army surveyor who worked in Pahang Penins Peninsular, Malaysia in 1965. When he got to the U.S., he had um, symptoms of malaria, and what they did was to get his blood and submit it to, um, there was no PCR, I think, then, but uh, to microscopic examination, and they saw that it was a different uh, type of malaria other than plasmodium malaria. So present time hosts of plasmodium nolsi are the long-tailed macaques and the pig-tailed macaques, so this one. So the known uh, vector, the most receptive species for P. nolsi is Anopheles balabasensis. So if you know where Balabac is, it's in the southern part of Palawan or the southernmost town of Palawan. So Pinolsai malaria is widely distributed in Sarawak and Sabah, in Bornean Malaysia, and to Pahang Penins Peninsular Malaysia. So cases have been documented in Thailand, Myanmar, and Singapore, and in Palawan, in the Philippines. So this is the distribution of the opinolsi in Southeast Asia. As you can see from here, most of the cases were discovered by ba the Singh, uh, Balbir Singh and Janet Cox Singh in Sarawak, in the Kapit district. And uh, also in um, Sabah. So the Philippines also has in the during this writing it thought there were five cases and one from, and then we have from singapore single cases from singapore in five cases in uh in, in pehang and then uh, one case also from thailand okay so what have we done in the philippines so in 2008 uh, Lut Chavez reported five cases of human infections with Pinolsai in Palawan. So her work was done in 2006 and she reported it in 2008. So Pinolsai was confirmed through nested PCR assays at the University of Malaysia in Sarawak. And uh, because her samples, uh, the samples that gave a positive Pinolsai infection were from the north in Rojas in Palawan and to the south, uh, mid 
in the middle of Puerto Princesa in Bakungan and in the south in Agawan, also in uh, Puerto Princesa. Um, by the time that we started the monkey bar uh, project, there were already 22 cases, I think, uh, recorded in Bakungan. So we did the monkey bar project from 2013 to 2018. And the title of our project was defining the biomedical, environmental and social risk factors for human infection with plasmodium nulsi. Opportunities for prevention and control of an emerging zoonotic infection, very long title. So this was a research that we did with the Saba Wildlife Center, uh, RITM and the uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So there were three components uh, and the uh, sites were in Sabah and in Palawan. So we had the sociology component which um, worked with the people of Bakungan. Then entomology, they collected um, mosquitoes and our group did the primatology study. So we uh, were on field for more than two years. So what did we do in the primatology component? We followed, we made, um, with, uh, we choose three sites in Bakugan wherein we, where in we can uh, follow the monkeys. So we had three sites. One was an, a disturbed area, a moderately disturbed area, and a primary forest. So these sites were um, a bit far from each other. So what we did, we did phenology studies um, to determine when monkeys would be in our transects, whether uh, during um, rainy season, um, dry season, or when the trees are have fruits and um, other considerations uh, for us to know whether the monkeys are there or not. And um, because the main objective was to of the study was to detect penal sigh from feces of the long-tailed macaque. So uh, we had, we collected feces every time we go on field, we had to collect fresh feces. That's why we have to, to go on transit at before the sun rises. We have to get up, wake up before the sun rises because as they say, the monkeys will start moving as the sun rises. So we did that for almost three years. We collected feces and um, we kept them in the refrigerator for at four degrees centigrade. We were waiting for Saba to develop a primer so that we can extract the DNA. But until the end of the project, uh, there were no primers that were developed. So it, the project ended there. Uh, but my students were able to use the feces for uh, examination of uh, enteroparasites. Okay, so that's what we did with the monkey bar project. So I cannot say anything about entomology or the sociology part of it. So, um, but one very good thing that came out of this monkey thing was that one of our graduate students who was a, an advisee of Dr. Vachel Gay Palier was very interested in uh, looking at um, uh, the plasmodium uh, parasites of long-tailed macaques, macaques in the Philippines. So he did his study at the 
uh, he collected blood, not feces, he collected blood from uh, monkeys from the uh, BMB, what is that, the National Wildlife Rescue and Rehabilitation Center at the BMB and at the Palawan Wildlife Rescue and Conservation Center and at the uh, PPSRNP at the Central Park, the forest of the Central Park in the Underground River in Palawan. And uh, his um, results were very exemplary. He was able to find all five uh, plasmodium um, parasites in the monkeys from the um, from those which were taken from the PPSRNP and some from the uh, Palawan Wildlife Rescue and Conservation Center in Puerto Princesa, but none in the uh, National Wildlife Rescue and Rehabilitation Center in um, at the BMB. So he concluded that so while long-tailed macaques from the from Palawan are infected with all five of the uh, pala, uh, plasmodium parasites. Okay. So infection in macaques showed that did not show does not show any symptoms of disease. That this is one of the things that we wanted to know uh, whether uh, we can by looking at the monkey we can know that it has malaria. So it, they don't show any symptoms of disease. Uh, infections can, can be by multiple species of plasmodium and a single monkey. And so susceptibility and infection are enhanced by splenectomy and or immunosuppression in juvenile animals. So other, other, uh, um, so on um, um, agents which can be transmitted from humans to non human primate transmission are included in this report. So we have TB. So humans are the only non reserve one estimated that one third of world population is infected, but most are inactive or latent cases. So long tailed macaques show a broad range of response from latent disease to chronic active disease, which also occurs in human infections. So these differences in response to exposure are important because animals which quickly succumb to the disease are unlikely to be reservoirs, while those with sufficient resistance to contain the infection at a subclinical level may be able to harbor and transmit the mycobacteria to conspecifics and humans. And so, so TB is found in much of the natural range of macaca fascicularis. So synanthropic populations would show evidence of exposure to TB. And one of the many questions that remain is how exposure to TB would impact the health of this uh, population of macaques. So we also have endemic human respiratory viruses, which can impact uh, free-ranging populations. So you have parainfluenza 3, adenovirus, measles, and mumps. So these were found to be infectious to long-tailed macaques. And these were found to, be co to commonly infect children and are readily spread to synanthropic primate populations. So measles uh, are considered to be the most significant threat to long-tailed macaques which are found near human habitation. So infections with measles virus can cause pneumonia and has been associated with a spontaneous abortion of fetuses. So it has been known to cause significant mortality and morbidity in recently captured macaques who were likely immunocompromised due to poor nutrition, injuries associated with trapping and hunting, overcrowding, and poor husbandry. So measles vaccination is one of the major contributing factors to contrasting prevalence of measles in this respective macaque populations. This is vaccination of measles among children, not 
in macaques. So what are the other zoonotic pathogens? Uh, normal flora in long-tailed macaques. So uh, they would vary. So these are species of bacteria, viruses, and parasites common to the gastrointestinal tract of macaques. They vary in incidence and burden depending on the source of the macaque. So the, here are some pathogenic gastrointestinal bacteria, Campylobacter coli, Campylobacter jejuni, Shigella flexneri, Yersinia intercolitica, and Helicobacter pylori. So they can cause chronic gastritis and enterocolitis. They can be asymptomatic or can be associated with chronic there. They are, yeah, and are relatively common in Sinomoldus macaques. And then you have Balantidium coli. This is, we know what this is. So um, it is transmitted through fecal to oral route of transmission. And they vary from asymptomatic to persistent diarrhea, abdominal pain, and sometimes a perforated colon. So I barely saw so these are metapsoan parasites. Some of my students uh, discovered this in their uh, special, uh, in the special problem that they did, which they conducted with uh, uh, some of the feces of the macaques which we collected from Palawan. And then we have cystosoma, and we also have opportunistic parasites. I am given just three minutes. So I would like to present that maybe we can do this, strategies and considerations in um, curtailing the spread of zoonotic diseases for monkeys. So we should minimize or stop forest fragmentation. So you know, uh, we all know what the consequence are, consequences are if, we, uh, if the forest is fragmented. So we'll have different populations of macaques. So they, they will be separated, but some will uh, bring uh, zoonotic diseases to the new area where they, uh, to their new habitat and infect all the others. So there should be reduced encounters between monkeys and humans, uh, hunting, ecotourism, and field. When we do field research, we should not be very close to the monkeys. And we should limit access of monkeys to human habitations because uh, monkeys are prone to getting inside houses, defecating in the, inside the homes, um, and uh, will destroy a house if they are given entrance to it. So we should do research. Uh, research is very important uh, in the control of zoonosis in long-tailed macaques. So we should all do this. Uh, and you can add more to the research which we can do uh, if we have the time, the resources, and without this pandemic. So I would like to thank uh, Paolo Miguel Kim, my research assistant in Bakungan and the Bakungan primatology team. There is no better research assistant than Paolo. And then to my advice, Geneva Chavez, to Liz, and uh, to the person who helped me prepare this uh, webinar, my former advice, Michi Tati, and uh, the person who introduced us to uh, malar me to malaria research, Dr. Mary Grace Dacuma. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mom Jude. So let's give her a virtual round of applause. So we, we now go straight to the questions. So first question from Melania Seed the third. Good afternoon. If bitten by a monkey, where can we test for B virus infection? Are there laboratories in the Philippines that are capable of diagnosis? I think the RITM is uh, very capable. Um, you can. I am not very sure of uh, the hospitals in uh, the local hospitals. I think they are able to do this, but our ITM would be the best place to go to. So I'm related to that. Do we have vaccines available? 
for so no diseases from macaques? Uh, Jeremy, I am a wildlife biologist. <laughs> I don't really know about the, the the medicine of these things. Okay. So ma'am, it, it, from Vino Chan Mugnatan, uh, good afternoon. In case uh, of B virus being asymptomatic, how will we resolve the issues in wild habitat? Like in India, the resus macaques are in very close contact with human environment. They have to be tested. They, they have to have blood samples taken to the laboratory and be analyzed and tested. Can we have the next slide for the questions? Okay, from Gerald Santos, how do humans usually get infected? What are the usual modes of transmission of pathogens from monkeys to humans? Uh, if you notice my, during the earlier part of my lecture, uh, I showed you the route of transmission. There's a slide. Uh, I, can, I can go back to that slide. Can I go back to the slide? Is there a, so there was a table I, I showed uh, showing the how um, this pathogens, uh, the route of just a minute, uh, the parasite, the route of exchange and direction of exchange. So, what was that? How do humans usually get, infect, get infected when you get close to the monkeys? So, if you if you've been to the underground river in Puerto Princesa, the monkeys get close to you. So do not get close to the monkeys, do not get scratched, do not fight with the monkey when it gets your food because it will uh, surely bite or scratch you. So what are the usual modes of transmission? Um, through the bites, mm -hmm. from monkeys through the bites or through the saliva, um, scratches, and the feces. Um, okay. The feces. Okay. okay. Next question again from Melania Seed the third regarding Pinosay in Vietnam, Laos, and other Southeast Asian countries have a lot of monkeys. Why is it that there were no recorded cases? Well, these are tropical places that have many mosquitoes. Um, there were there are cases in Malaysia. Right? Malaysia has the highest number of cases as, uh, as of now uh, so remember that the first case was discovered in an army surveyor who worked in pahang malaysia in peninsular malaysia and um, the same couple um, discovered a prevalent uh, infection of penal sai in kapit district in sarawak and in samba um, we the study that the our counterpart in Sabad was done in Kudat, that is in the northernmost part of Borneo, and uh, so why there is there there were no recorded maybe there are cases but they were not reported, like what happened in Palawan there were cases but uh, if if there were no um, Blood, blood spots or microscopic examination. I mean, so, and, and if there is no PCR done, then you wouldn't know it was, it's penal size. It usually is identified as P. malaria. Okay, ma'am, related to that, are there records of human-to-human -human transmissions of that species? Of yes, uh, in Kodat, uh, it has been established uh, the publications are done by an Australian doctor who was with the sociology uh, component of our research in Kodat and uh, it was no longer monkey to humans but it was human to human transmission because of the proximity of those who are infected with, with those who are not in the community. So the monkeys were no longer coming because there was deforestation. There were only uh, palm, oil palm uh, plantations. So it was already, the, the, the mosquitoes were already biting the humans and then when they would bite another, 
So it's a human-to-human -human transmission. No longer monkey-to-human transmission. Okay, ma'am. Uh, we have a question again. In our studies, we were collect we collected more than 100 fecal samples of Nicobar long-tailed macaques, but we were fa we failed to amplify the malarial DNA in fecal samples. Maybe load malarial DNA in fecal samples were very low. What are your suggestions for alternative um, way to report the presence of malaria parasite from fecal samples? Um, one thing, one one the the problem with uh, fecal some I mean looking for uh, uh, the parasite in feces is that as of now I don't know if they already had this but the in 2018 they were still not able to uh, produce primers to be able to amplify the DNA in uh, from the fecal samples of the long-tailed macaques. Uh, but uh, you can determine the, the, when you look at it in the microscope, uh, you, some would be able, or microscopists now would be able to determine the difference between uh, trophozoites, I think, of plasmodium malaria uh, and uh, plasmodium nolsi. So they would have to be trained in order to know, to tell the difference between the two species. Uh, next question, ma'am, from Dr. Lu Cardenas. Can subclinical latent infections die a natural death? Like in macaque, like if macaque becomes uninfected again or healthy without human or outside intervention? If you don't, um, if they're inside the forest, I think, uh, remember what I said um, earlier that they are seropositive, but they don't uh, that they but they don't uh, manifest. As asymptomatic. They are asymptomatic. Okay. Uh, nawala na ako sa screen. Uh, uh, um, okay. Maybe a okay. last question. Yes. Do you have next steps for this wonderful presentation, especially that many ecotourism services? offer oh. macaque interactions both wild and captive individuals. This is this very I, useful for future legislations? Um, uh, the best thing that we can do is to really not be in contact with the macaques, but we cannot uh, stop that, especially with farmers, especially with ecotourism areas where there are macaques. One thing that we should not do is to feed the macaques. Do not feed the macaques. We always are told not to feed the macaques because they will come near and if you don't give them food, if you tease them, then uh, they can uh, bite or scratch. So we should not do that. And then we should not, or we should stop deforestation. We should not uh, do anything with the forest where they live. We just leave them alone. Okay, I think that also answers the last question pasted here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So once again, thank you very much, Ma'am Jude, for the okay. interesting and informative talk. Uh, at this point, allow me to present an electronic certificate of recognition signed by our director, Juan Carlos D. Gonzalez. So everyone, let's go. I'll give uh, Ma'am Jude a virtual round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, so, and I'm sorry, this is my first time. <laughs> <laughs> for allow for a big for a audience. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, also, the museum will also be giving a token of appreciation. Uh, oh. This one will have a, a physical frame photograph by Natural Geographic photo arc, uh, Joel Sartore. Thank Sartore. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Congrats, ma'am. Thank you. And. Nasana. Oh. Uh, 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 and then come in again. Uh, later. Po. So, okay, before that, before we end, uh, let me give uh, out a, a, a few reminders. Please fill out seminar evaluation form, uh, flash in the screen to get a certificate of participation. Uh, the link is also copied in the chat box. We are also giving out 
a link to six printable souvenir cards featuring photos taken by Nat Geo photographer Joel Sartore. The link is on the screen as you see and also pasted in the chat box. Finally, please follow uh, UPLB Museum in all our social media accounts, uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. And we are also now uh, on Wikipedia. We please uh, check our Wikipedia page and Wikipedia Commons. So firstly, okay, so let us all take a break. We hope to see you in our next seminar to be delivered by uh, Dr. Marian De Leon, which will be at 4 to 5 p.m. later this afternoon. So keep safe, everyone. Thank you and goodbye po. Maraming salamat.